It has tail of a beaver, bell of a duck, the feast cup with milk, but also lay eggs. What the hell is this weird animal? Well, let's find out. Hey guys, welcome to my channel. In today's video, let's talk about world's most bizarre animal. At the end of the 18th century, the isolated continent Australia became one of British colonies. People who came here opened their eyes and saw lots of animals that were endemic to Australia. In 1798, Captain John Hunt, the governor of New South Wales, discovered a strange animal which had never been seen before. In order to find out what it was, the governor sent a specimen of this animal back to England for naturalists to examine. After the specimen arrived in England, naturalists were all dumbfounded. This thing was the size of a rabbit. Focusing on the body, it looked like a beaver, but it had a duck's bill, which was outrageous. No one had ever seen it before. No one could even determine what the order and family it belonged to. At that time, George Shaw, the zoologist, strongly doubted that it was some kind of trick with sewing parts of different animals together. An anatomist named Robert Knox also agreed with this opinion. So George took the scissors to examine the specimen, trying to find the stitches and review the trick. Unfortunately, after carefully searching, there were no stitches at all, and the animal looked like that originally. Later, Shaw named this animal as platypus, which derived from Greek and literally means flat foot. Naturalists became increasingly interested in platypus but the more they studied, the more they got confused of it. Was it a reptile, a bird, or a mammal? Nobody could tell, because it looked like it's a patchwork of things from the discovery of this species. It took naturalists decades to figure out just a few things. First, it was worm-blooded, which excluded reptile. Then it had mammary glands to feed cubs and the body had fur instead of feathers, which excluded bird. So even with the duck's bell, most people still thought that this animal was mammal, and there was no dispute in this. However, there was only one thing that's a little confusing, and that's he had a cloaca, which was shared between excretion and reproduction, just like reptiles and birds. In addition, Someone accidentally found that the platypus had eggs in its body when dissected. And the aboriginals of Australia also said that this animal laid eggs. This was mind-blowing because mammals give birth live and they don't lay eggs at all, which only reptiles and birds do. Based on theory of that time period, this was a serious problem, especially in 1859 when Charles Darwin published the famous On the Origin of Species, proposing two theories. The first is that species are not static, and that all plants and animals evolved from earlier and more primitive forms. At the time, many people could not accept this theory, especially when it clearly contradicted the belief that God created everything. So what about the study of platypus? which looks like a species between reptile and mammals at this very point, inadvertently conforms to Darwin's view of evolution, much to the displeasure of conservatives and naturalists. So, at that time, there were two factions. One was conservative, led by the British, who did not believe that platypus could lay eggs, believing that platypus eggs were hatched in the body and they were still authentic mammals. The other faction is the French faction, which claimed that platypus lay eggs and hatch only after they had been laid. Arguing against the British, neither side was convinced by the other. So what's next? The naturalists said that if they could find a platypus that had just laid an egg, wouldn't it be over? So, in 1884, a Scottish zoologist William Cartwell came to Australia. He hired 150 aboriginals to help him find the eggs. 
and it eventually took him months to find evidence that the platypus did lay eggs and settled this argument. The mystery was solved, but it was even more difficult to figure out how to classify platypus. And in the end, it was decided to classify it as a mammal. Together with echina, it also lay eggs. There is a single whole, excretion and reproduction shared together. So it was later defined that mammals, in addition to worm blood, lactating, also usually give birth, not always. This description is especially added for the monotreme to which platypus belong. Later, research also found that a branch of monotreme, which appeared about 200 million years ago, was not the same as all other mammals and bearing live young, and there used to be many species in this branch. Only platypus and a few other species remain. The reason for the extinction is that mammals appeared later, like marsupial and placental animals, were more advanced and more viable. So they gradually phased out in monotreme, taking over the earth after the dinosaur era. So the question is, Australia also had advanced mammals, right? How could platypus survive till now? First of all, one of the most important reasons why platypus survive is because it lives in the water, which reduces competition. For the convenience of swimming, the platypus has flippers on all four paws, especially the two front paws, which are ridiculously large. They are twice as long as its claws, and the posture of its swimming is a bit like dog paddle, alternating left and right. But he doesn't paddle on his hind legs, he uses them as auxiliary steering instead. And the tail is used to store fat. So the happier he lives, the fatter his tail will be, which can provide lots of buoyancy. In addition, you may have noticed when platypus gets out of the water, he always likes to shake his head. His swimming motion seems uncoordinated. Is it because of swimming skills? Of course not. Spin in the water for hundreds of millions of years, how can platypus not swim well? The reason is, if you look closely, the platypus has no ears, only two ear holes, and they are hidden in the same slit behind their small eyes. As soon as he gets into water, the slit will close, covering the eyes and ears, and then the nostril on the beak will also close. In other words, He's deaf and blind when he dives, neither can he smell. And in such a state, if he wants to find any prey, he can only rely on special abilities. Monotremes are the only mammals known to have a sense of electroreception, and the platypus's electroreception is the most sensitive of any monotreme. Digging in the bottom of streams with its bill, its electrical receptors detect tiny electric currents generated by the muscular contraction of its prey, enabling it to distinguish between animate and inanimate objects. The platypus's bill is not very hard. It's soft, and it has rubbery feel that has about 40,000 electrical receptors on it. The prey it likes to eat is basically in the mud, the sand, and the bottom of the water, such as crabs, shrimps, earthworms, insects, and so on. They all emit bioelectricity whenever they move, which can be detected by platypus nearby, which is much better than sight or smell since the water is cloudy. The reason why he shake his head was equivalent to simulating the wide head of a hammerhead shark, and the wider the range of the receptors, the easier it was to locate the prey. It is said that there is a kind of local blue kingfisher that likes to trace platypus. And why? Because the platypus will drive out the shrimp and insects in the bottom of the water when it stirs up in the mud and sand. A kingfisher follows the platypus to have a chance to hunt and feed itself. And that's very clever. Platypus spend more than 10 hours a day in the water looking for food to feed his stomach. However, He's still a semi-aquatic animal, because when not hunting, he still needs to go ashore to rest. 
Generally speaking, platypus lives along near waterside in a hole he dug, which is usually very deep, can be three to five meters, and is quite safe. Speaking of which, some viewers may find a problem. As we just said, the front flippers of platypus are very large, twice as long as our claws. How can this structure be used in digging? It turns out that his big flipper can be folded up, and he folds the flipper back to expose the claw when he goes ashore. This design is very clever, and it is not a problem to dig a hole a few meters deep. When it's mating season, female platypus has to expand her burrow. First, male finds a female and bites the female's tail from behind to express his willing. If the female agrees, he turns around and bites the male's tail as well. The two form a circle and then turn around twice. The mating can begin. After it's done, the male simply goes away, leaving the female alone to start a big project on her own. She would deepen the burrow to about 20 meters deep, and then roll some fallen leaves, reeds, and aquatic plants with her tail to the hole, only to build a nest in the deepest place to prepare for laying eggs. And finally, to add some obstacle in the aisle to block the hole and hide it. Then it's completed. After about a month, platypus lays one to three eggs, each about the size of a bird's egg. She put the eggs in between the tail and belly and incubate them with body heat. Then in about 10 days, a baby platypus will break out of its shell. As a mammal, breastfeeding is a must. But you'll be amazed by this little animal. Platypus doesn't have nipples, which is confusing to us. But their cubs end up licking milk instead of sucking. What does this mean? Mother platypus secretes milk directly onto the hair on the surface of the body through the mammary glands in the abdomen, just like sweating. Then the cubs lick it on the abdomen, and this milk is somewhat like sweat. Having been fed for four months, baby platypuses grow to about 30 centimeters. When they grow into adults, they need to find new places, make their own holes, and go into the water to find foods by themselves. The freeze where they were most like mammals in their lives were over. As I mentioned earlier, platypus is haunted by electrolocation. This is very rare among mammals, so there is another thing that's also very different. It's called vinum. And in general, only amphibians, reptiles, and fish have vinum. Barely any birds have, let alone mammals, and the platypus is even more venomous, making it more of an intermediate species. So which part of his body is venomous? The platypus has spikes on its hind legs. There is venom in it. It's not highly poisonous in terms of toxicity, and a stab won't kill a human, but it can kill a dog, although not fatal for human. The pain caused by the platypus vinum is still very irritating, and the pain can last for months. Scientists have studied this vinum and found that it contains four toxins, three of which have not been seen elsewhere, exclusively from platypus. These toxins are said to be useful for medicine, both in the development of painkillers and diabetes drugs, which is considered a major contribution of platypus to human. In addition to this, another inspiration from platypus may be more important. This inspiration comes from the way platypus feeds, which is what I just said about milk licking. A platypus secretes milk directly onto the belly from which the cub licks it, which isn't hygienic. Compared to other mammals that feed directly with their nipples, there must be lots of bacteria mixed with the milk. Even so, the cub doesn't get sick. There must be some mystery in platypus milk. And two papers in 2014 and 2018 are dedicated to platypus milk. First of all, researchers have found that platypus milk has a special milk protein, which has super antibacterial ability. Its structure is very special. The new discovery may well be the key to explain as to platypus cub fights against bacteria. Nowadays, Bacteria are becoming increasingly resistant to antibiotics, 
Should super bacteria appear, human might not even be able to deal with bacterial infections. Consequences are severe. If the platypus's special protein can shed some light on medicine development, perhaps humans will be able to find a new way to fight against bacterial infection besides antibiotics. It's time to talk about threats platypus faces. After all, if the animal becomes extinct, then there is no hope for our medicine development. Before 1911, European fur trade was the greatest danger to platypus. And although it was not so expensive as sea otter fur, platypus fur were also of the highest quality, found only in Australia. Scarcity of platypus fur led to killing of platypus. In addition, some Aboriginal have the habit of eating platypus, especially its large fat tail, which is said to be particularly nutritious. But now there are very few because platypus is protected species in all the habitats. The biggest threat to platypus now is habitat loss. The range of human activity is getting increasingly large, leaving less and less area for them. The development and utilization of water resources, along with water pollution, is destructing the environment of platypuses. In Tasmania, for example, there are many platypuses that died on bridges caused by traffic accidents. Human infrastructure has changed their course so that they have no choice but to cross the road. How to avoid these casualties is also an issue. Platypus is assessed as near-threatened species in 2016. Whether to upgrade or not is being discussed. I hope that this little unique creature can survive as long as possible so that our future generation will be able to see it, not only in textbook, but also in real life. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. Please give me a thumbs up, comment below, and subscribe to my channel if you haven't. And if you have time, why not stick around and check out my other videos? See you in the next one. Bye.